Um, you could co keep creating all these harms, but at the end of the day, we've listed multiple harms that will be solved with this approach that will not be solved if we continue the status quo. Cool, I've got time. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you for coming. The biggest problem with the affirmative case so far is that the case is one, extremely assertive, but also two, very vague in terms of what exactly host, like open ocean aquaculture development is, what the unique impacts are, why exactly we need to accelerate this development, how we're going to accelerate this development, and why this solves the problems you want to do. Um, and so firstly, I'm going to clarify like what our stance is on the negative as to what we support and why we're okay with that. Then I'm going to go into a bit of like contention and talk about why some of the framing from their side is assertive and doesn't really give us any unique information about <clears throat> why their side of the house is better. And then I'm going to move into my arguments. Broadly, we have three key ideas we want to talk about in this debate. One, we're going to talk about the economic harms of open ocean agriculture development. Secondly, we're also going to talk to you about the environmental impacts. And lastly, we're going to talk to you about the idea of collaboration and relationships and why those are inherently very harmful and not possible when it comes to ocean open agriculture development. So firstly, what is our stance in this debate on the negative? What do we support? We think that generally research is good. We think putting money into things like open ocean aquaculture development or any other kind of development in aquaculture is good and we're willing to support money being put into this. What we don't think we should do is accelerate development or put a lot of money into this because we think ocean open aquaculture is expensive and we think the burden on affirmative is to prove why this expense is okay to do given the vast amount of negative harms. Even if we're not able to prove any negative harms, they need to show us why there is any kind of cost benefit analysis that is unique to ocean open aquaculture that necessitates this acceleration of development. But secondly, notice how they never tell us what exactly this acceleration looks like or why it's useful. So we'll give you that analysis, right? We think ocean open aquaculture is more expensive and needs more development for three reasons. One, right now we already have limited techniques for rare species like along like coastlines and therefore we need to develop more techniques. Secondly, we have limited technology and open ocean aquaculture requires far more expensive and far more complicated technology because these open oceans are uh, environments which have like very high wind current, very high wave uh, situations and therefore you need to be able to build more resistant technology. But secondly, there's an increased diversity of species which we haven't dealt with before. So a lot, lot of research has to, be done, uh, has to be done to make sure that we do these things in an environmentally sustainable way. And that um, all of this will be important when I talk about my analysis. So moving on, now that we've clarified like, what exactly we support and why we're okay supporting that, what are some problems that came across in the affirmative case? But only we hear two key ideas, right? One, that the US needs to accelerate this to meet seafood demand, and that it's going to increase the production of like shellfish and other fish. And the other idea is in, like environment, how it's going to harm like species, but also humans. Firstly, on the idea of the US needing to accelerate this, right? One, and we kind of highlighted this in the cross-examination, we don't see why this debate is necessarily from the perspective of the United States. We don't think that the United States is the main stakeholder because that isn't really clarified anywhere in the topic. We think this is generally about the idea of open ocean aquaculture development. So if you're going to give us claims like um, like other countries not being able to, like, like the US not importing um, shellfish from other countries anymore, you need to clarify why it's okay for there to be a massive loss of jobs in those countries because they just said, oh, we'll create more American jobs. We don't see why this is good globally, right? But secondly, even if this was from the perspective of the US, one, we think there are other sources for uh, other sources of aquaculture. We don't see why like the open ocean is going to be able to give us more fish or it's going to be able to like meet this demand. So this argument in and of itself doesn't really tell us why this is a reason to do this. But lastly, we think even if we take them at their best case, even if they're able to prove that the US can actually manufacture more fish, we don't necessarily see why they have to do it, right? And this is something we brought up in cross-examination as well. The idea that specialization in an economy is a good thing, that if certain countries focus on producing like goods that they are already good at producing and have already invested a lot of money into, is going to drive costs down. Which means at the end of the day, if a consumer has a cheaper product of fish to buy, regardless of where it was from, they're likely to buy that product. So we don't see why any of the fish manufactured on that side of the house is going to be bought. And secondly, the idea of environment, notice that all of their analysis is very assertive. If you're going to tell us things like pesticides and diseases, all of these exist, we need to know why these are going to not exist when you're like uh, doing research into open ocean agriculture. 
especially when they wanted to tell us that they're very similar and the only difference is that people are not going to see this on their coastlines. We needed more unique analysis. And lastly, like they, they brought like the idea of like a map, which is like a unique, like expensive piece of technology. We don't think that this is like the most common form of like um, infrastructure we're going to see, and I'll talk more about that in my article. So firstly, on the idea of economics and why this is a terrible idea economically. One, operation costs. We think the operation costs are just huge. And if they wanted to talk about like any form of productions, they need to weigh this against the operation costs, right? Why are oper operation costs much more expensive for open ocean agriculture development? Five reasons why. One, just the idea that oceans are big means you need to spend much, much more money on things like fuel, longer transport times, if it's things like carrying like livestock with these fish to eat in, or literally anything that's going to take you more days, more time, more fuel. Secondly, the, the fact that these oceans are really big means it's much harder to control the environment, right? It's harder for you to control things like temperature, and therefore you need to find more expensive ways to work around. Thirdly, we think technology is going to be more expensive. I talked about how wave currents, wind situations are more different, and you need to build like more resistance structures. Four, you need to build completely new infrastructure, right? Because right now, most of it happens along the coastline, and it's easy to interact like, with things that exist on the coast. But now you need to create more supportive shoreside infra infrastructure, which doesn't already exist, for these things to be transported. Five, we think there's a lot of miscellaneous costs when it comes to the open ocean. Things like security and surveillance to look around the area that doesn't exist right now on the coast, which you can easily monitor, but that will exist. Second thing, we strongly contest the idea that the kind of seafood that's being cultivated here is the kind that people want to eat in the first place, right? Uh, Dylan already talks to you about how like shrimp and salmon aren't the kinds of fish that were cultivated here. But furthermore, notice that even if these are, right, even if like a, a lot of the fish we're going to be cultivating here are like the highly carnivorous fish, the problem with that is to be able to sustain this, you need to have a wide, sub, uh, like a large supply of wild fish to feed these larger carnivorous fish. And we just don't see how that's going to be sustainable. That's going to drive up the demand for more fish. We don't think that's sustainable. And lastly, on the idea of unemployment, we think that um, we think that unemployment is likely to occur because, like they said, this is going to take like these um, these um, sources of employment away from local communities and the coastline. And also, we think even if it does work, it's going to reduce labor costs. And Dylan will talk about it. Thank you. Another of the great theory of fifteen seconds in history. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, um, so for you said that it's going to be much harder to control environments. Um, could you elaborate on that, given that we can only do that as an enclosed space? Yeah, so the idea is like, um, like in the bigger, like in bigger oceans, there are many more variable things to account for. So things like wave currents, which are much harder, like winds and things like storms are going to be much harder to deal with compared to on the coastline, where like even your enclosed environment is in like a much smaller area, which is easier to monitor. So it's um, we have, we, we said in the AC, we actually have remote controls that can control the environment in the enclosed area. Um, the area is away from the environmental factors, so I don't really see that how that argument Like, it's impossible to, like, completely isolate something from the environmental factors, because at some level, you need to interact with the any ecosystem. We are going to be, like, capturing this fish. And so it's like very assertive, I think, to claim that it's just going to be completely isolated from the environment. Because you have, like, already we see that it's very hard along the coastline to control temperatures and make sure that things like diseases aren't rampant. This was something you considered in your own analysis when we talked about how other countries, uh, like, uh, produce a lot of fish which have a lot of, like, diseases and pesticides. So you don't see how, like, some remote control controlling it from, like, much farther away is going to be able to, like, control this kind of thing. Well, um, I mean, one, as well as enclosed, it is enclosed. You can't say that we have made it enclosed. There's proof that a map system is being done. It's a completely enclosed cell. Um, two, as for the harmful ingredients that we were talking about, those are like um, chemicals that are used during the production system by other countries because they are not illegal in those countries, where these chemicals are illegal in the United States. So we will not be putting those chemicals into the system when we're taking the shrimp out and we're cleaning the shrimp or wherever they use them, we will not be using them. That is used by humans. Those are not environmental factors. Okay, so two responses. One, I think that's assertive and also just not true. Like in 2003, there's the example of the hematopoietic necrophilitis in British Columbia or like other American regions, which was found in like, which was found in salmon. So this is, wasn't even like fish that was exported from somewhere else. But secondly, the reason diseases are far, far worse in the open ocean is because in the open ocean, you have like a much bigger diversity of species, which means there's a much bigger chance of these diseases being spread from the wild fish that exist there. But why it becomes far worse is because these diseases can become, like can develop far worse like viral strains at the point at which all of these fish are like collected in a certain region, 
which we, so basically the idea is that like yeah, but, you, but everything you're saying right now we are getting rid of that we're getting rid of those cons that you're but it's like extremely absurd like i don't see how you're getting rid of those cons like clearly I it's like, we have an enclosed space in this in the modular it is in the ocean the environment in the ocean is not getting into the space therefore those fish that you're saying are going to be transporting these diseases and whatnot are not interacting with the fish that's or okay. the shellfish so that's being grown. Right now, along the coastline, do diseases exist in the United States and like the way they produce fish? If they do, you need to tell me why that exists right now and why that's not going to exist in the open ocean. If they don't exist, we don't see why the United States won't just continue putting money into that, given that there are no diseases. So you need to clarify which one it is. I'm and not why sure open. why you're talking about the U.S. coastline. We're talking about diseases that are in, going on in Southeast Asia, where 90% of the shrimp is imported from. We're not talking about what's happening on the U.S. coastlines. Okay, but if your problem is with other countries, why can't the U.S. just focus on developing this along the coastline if it's not going to have any of those environmental impacts? And it's also going to create more employment opportunities. Why do you need to go out into the open ocean, spend far more money to do the same thing you could do along How is it made, how is there less employment opportunities in the open ocean versus the coastline? Because if you, anything, there's more. As you said earlier, there's more work to go regulate the modular. That's your argument. Now you're contradicting yourself by saying that there's less jobs. If anything, that's more jobs if there's more regulation, which is what you're trying to say. Well, I don't see why regulation leads to more jobs. The idea is that local fishermen and local communities, so how is, these how are jobs that are more accessible to them because they're less likely going to be able to like, operate like more complicated technology, which they have no idea. Uh, that was our time for questions. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, I think we have time for one more Once again, the affirmative um, in this debate um, stand that the acceleration of open ocean aquaculture development is desirable. Um, first, um, extending our point that the United States needs to accelerate open ocean aquaculture to meet its growing demand for food, for seafood, once again, seafood consumption is growing and we need a waning to meet that demand. Right now, in the status quo, um, current initiative, um, current, init current, um, current um, like fish um, farming um, initiatives aren't. Um, and just like the way that fish farming is done isn't the most sustainable or the most um, or the most beneficial. Once again, like um, from the first term of speech, us importing seafood from other countries is harmful because other countries have these chem have various chemicals. They will use antib antibodies to, fe to feed the fish or um, pesticides to kind of take out seaweed and stuff like that to uh, create those farming environments. And because we have no way of regulating what other countries do, we need to have. Um, open ocean aquaculture in the United States so that we have a better way of regulating what kind of seafood enters our market. Um, and on our second point, um, open ocean aquaculture is a viable solution to increasing the supply of domestic shellfish. Once again, the, the, the negative says that this technology, that they are we have lack of technology, but we, what we are saying is that this technology already exists. We have one example of a company in Falmouth, Massachusetts that has our mass module that we are um, affirming with our plan. And also it's been done by other countries. There's a, there's like an oyster farm in Norway and a fish farm in um, Ecuador that has um, open open that does it through open ocean aquaculture. And so the technology there, once again, it already it exists, but and there's also room for it to grow. And um, and what the app is doing affirming for is the growth of um, that technology in the United States. And um, also that selfish selfish cultivation uses less energy and promotes a healthy diet. This is from. Um, CART and Cal Matters in 2020, uh, raising a, a doctoral candidate in the University of California, Santa Barbara, who studies aquaculture policy as a cheerleader for farmed shellfish, saying that these creatures are sustainable and require much less energy to produce and are healthy to eat. It is close as we can get to a free lunch when it comes to animal protein. Um, once again, um, uh, just by doing it through our math, we have um, ability, uh, abilities to um, harvest shellfish and we can control um, the amount, we have the ability to regulate um, like the use of chemicals or just the use of or not using chemicals at all that are harmful um, to um, just human for human consumption in the environment. And so once again, when consuming imported shellfish harms Americans, consumers, and the environment, this is the, 
the next step that the, we didn't have a reason why to let them, but this is the reason. It's because it's bad for us to eat it, and it's also bad for the environment. Um, other countries will use chemicals that will either that like won't be consuming, which once again isn't good for us, or will get released into the environment and just harm the the, the general ecosystems over there. And so that is also. Um, um, so, um, and we have no way to regulate that because we're not the other countries, obviously. So, um, this is why you need to um, provide the permits to other um, local fisheries and other private companies for the map boat system um, to use so that they have other ways to, to uh, develop shellfish farming um, and um, for, their, for their own personal markets. Um, and just to answer some of the arguments they made, um, they made, an answer, they made an argument in Crossic saying that it was like a cost deficit, but um, once again, um, this actually lowers shellfish prices because aquaculture, uh, will, um, it will reduce prices um, and also result in a higher demand for seafood from all sources. And this is from um, JJAC 2023 uh, from the National Aquaculture Association. Um, aquaculture products, whether imported or domestic, may compete with wild caught fisheries in some markets, so they also compete with chicken, beef, and pork. Uh, this net effect will, temporary, will, will actually reduce prices and year round product availability due to aquaculture production, that is the total market and consumption for shrimp and salmon, wild farms, and, and, uh, which is then inc increased. Wild products have been able to position themselves as a premium, higher priced market in the marketplace, or higher priced product in the marketplace, and, um, and so that way that there's this competition will exist with or without domestic aquaculture. The United States can't meet consumer seafood demand so through wild-caught fishing activities alone. So this is just talking about how um, because it's like an, um, it'll become marketed as something that's locally produced as opposed to being imported, which will create a higher demand for it. And just overall, due to the competition, the prices of it being locally produced will make it lower. Um, and also on their environment, um, uh, there's a Froelich meta-analysis of, um, of their 70 peer-reviewed studies that finds that there's zero environmental harm to offshore agriculture. This is from JJAC 2023. Um, a peer-reviewed analysis of 70 publications um, concerned farms located in the U.S., Spain, and Germany focused on the potential ecological impacts of offshore farms and tended to report no significant effects. Evidence of environmental impact is extremely unlikely. Um, and also they said um, on their coastline argument, um, um, Doing um, the open ocean aquaculture on the shoreline once again would just not be desirable because one, um, especially like in places like Cape Cod, where it's a very high tourist rate, even in other places along uh, the U.S. coast where there's a high population of tourism, it's not desirable for tourists or even like locals to just see a huge boat off the shoreline. Like no one wants to see that when they're you know on vacation, and so it's easier to have it away because that's out of people's point of view and. Um, and just like um, more remote so that it's not in the way of just like normal fish, just normal um, like um, functions around, along the coastline. And um, also it's better to have it away so that, um, like away from the land so that like, um, it's like, e it's easier to control. And um, also on the environment, um, there's, um, we, we have the remote system that allows the environment to be controlled for us to drive over farming. Um, so this is not a debate about the U.S. importing shellfish or like other fish from other countries versus doing doing it themselves for two reasons. One, there is nothing in the motion that it, that states that this mo like topic is America specific, so we don't see why we're even arguing about this from the perspective of the U.S. So one, I would like you to clarify why we don't care about other countries and how their fish demands are being met. But two, even if this was from the perspective of the U.S., why is this a debate about the U.S. doing it? themselves versus other countries doing it. We, we think the debate is about ocean open open ocean aquaculture development versus other forms of aquaculture development, like marine culture development, where it happens in shore. And even your statistic which you talked about, about aquaculture meeting demands and having less environmental like less environmental impacts, wasn't about open ocean aquaculture. It was about aquaculture as a whole which existed. Okay, so <coughs> The resolution didn't state whether, obviously, I'm just going to say the resolution didn't state whether or not we had to affirm the United States. Well, we also were, our, like, the resolution also didn't um, affirm that or, like, state that we had to, we were responsible for doing it across the whole world. So our plan is just more specific to the United States. Obviously, and once we have this plan, we can produce this technology and allow the permits. Other countries have the complete freedom to follow on and also, you know, develop similar technologies. Like, like I said before, Norway has other um, open ocean aquaculture um, 
efforts in southern Ecuador and so many other countries have it too. But right now we're just focusing on one one idea of um, of pursuing open ocean aquaculture within the United States just to make the environment and also just the fish market for us personally a little bit safer. So could you answer the second question then? Uh, um, can you elaborate? I, yeah, the second question. So this stat you had about like aquaculture and how it's good for maintaining shark production, like it was quoted by someone and you had like a bunch of like numbers. That was referring to aquaculture as a whole, which includes not just open ocean aquaculture, and in fact more forms of other types of aquaculture because whales have been developed more over the years. Yeah. So basically, what this what this like piece of evidence was just saying was that this was just answer just a general just extend a general claim that overall felt sh um, cultivating shellfish. Um, and more so with through our MAPS programs is that it'll be, um, it will produce less energy and as opposed to saying like, um, it was just also like a preemptive saying like, oh, like why not do other types of fish? But this is just saying like shellfish more specifically is a, a good way to go in terms of um, like developing open ocean aquaculture with respect of like, once again, making it safe, more safe for human consumption for like a healthy diet and just for the environment in general. So, Ignoring the fact that this is from other countries, how is it more environmentally beneficial, or how are there less diseases or less pesticides when the U.S. is the same actor in both cases, and in one case does it in the open ocean, and in the other case does it along the coast? Um, we're not, well doing it once again. Like I said, doing it along the coast, it's um, not desirable. It's just not desirable because once again, it's it, the 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 picture showed it. It's just a huge boat and. Once again, no one wants that. It just kind of ends their fuel division, and it also does does interrupt other um, other like other companies farming um, if it's just in the way of where their farms are. And so it's better to have it away from the ocean because um, once again, it's out of people's field of view, and um, the fact that it's remote and enclosed allows it to be allows it to work like outside of the general shorelines, just so that like um, it, it it doesn't interfere with other like. Um, with other like let's say like coral or seaweed or or, or fish that are more local to the shore, it doesn't interrupt you know their where their migration patterns and where they kind of live and exist um, along the shoreline. Okay, last question: Does the app have like an idea of like a number of what proportion of fish right now is cultivated through open aquaculture compared to like other forms of aquaculture which have already been done in those years? Do we have a what? I missed. Like an accurate estimate of how much fish is already cultivated in other forms of aquaculture. Um, I don't have it off the top of my head, but it's that's something we want within twelve years to finish. But that was the end of our um, cross examination. Yeah. Right, thank you, Before going on to the three main clashes in this debate, I just want to acknowledge a few things. <laughs> one, the framing on their side is quite narrow, because they essentially say this is about the US and no one else, and they don't give a reason. In the cross-exam, we questioned this, and they said, oh, well, it doesn't say it's not about the US. But if we're going to debate like that, we can just say, like, we can just place that in some third world country that simply cannot afford to invest this very expensive technology and say, we win the debate, because there are other things more important, like buying food. That's probably not how the debate works. It probably needs to be on a grander scale, right? We're going to talk about, in general, is it good, is it viable, does it benefit other countries as well? So already their case is quite narrow, and we talked about one country. But we're going to entertain it anyway to debate under that frame, because otherwise the classes are quite strange. It's just important to acknowledge that first. Secondly, it is odd that they say this is specifically about very enclosed spaces and like fully controlled environments, right? Because in most cases, when it comes to open ocean aquaculture, it is things like netting around more fish that get like, you know, free reign around the areas. That's the entire benefit of having free open ocean aquaculture in the very first place that it involves the ocean environment. With their framing, there is absolutely no benefit to having these completely isolated pens of water in the middle of the ocean, 300 miles away from the coast, as compared to literally on land, right next to, right, like literally anywhere, right? So there's no unique benefit if it's truly an enclosed space. That makes the arguments very uncomparative. Anyways, three clashes in this debate. One, on essentially their entire argument, the US needs to produce food, specifically shrimp and shellfish. Three points of response to this entire idea that takes it out on every level. One, the majority of fish market that we're debating is about shrimp, right? And we agree. But what we told you is that current research shows when it comes to actually having shrimp farming, it's a very poor candidate to use open ocean aquaculture. Because in general, as they said, it is tropical environments, it is ponds, it is not in the middle of the entire ocean. 
The only way they account for this is, once again, these fully enclosed environments, to which we essentially just say, you can literally build them anywhere. Why build them 300 miles in the middle of the ocean when it's very expensive to get to, very difficult to build, very hard to maintain? If you have it on the coastline, have it on land, it's probably much cheaper in the comparative. That really takes out the entirety of the argumentation, and there's no unique reason to invest in open ocean agriculture, which is what they have to defend. Secondly, on the comparison versus importing, what they say is less regulation is bad because you know there are things like toxic chemicals. This seems to be an argument against all imports, right? There's nothing unique about shellfish here. You probably have to therefore spend a lot of money on all sorts of other foodstuffs when it comes to production. That's not a very unique argument. But anyways, an even bigger issue is the economic viability. Because as we told you, when it comes to the open market, people buy what is the cheapest. Therefore, even when you produce better shrimp and safer shrimp, the fact that it's going to be more expensive for the many reasons we gave you when you tell you it's very hard to go to the middle of the ocean to produce, build these pens, invest in the research, all those things, people are still going to opt for the cheaper shrimp. Their response to this literally agrees with us because they say, oh, open, like, open ocean agriculture fishing is going to be seen as a high-end product. That means it doesn't displace the majority of products which is being imported from other countries. People simply can't afford it and won't choose the, cheap, the more expensive product. Therefore, you don't actually replace the worst shrimp, right? So even if we admit there are certain you know, issues, that doesn't solve the problem. Furthermore, it's still a problem-solution mismatch. If the issue is there's shrimp coming in that is bad for our health, why don't we just invest in you know, more technologies and checking what shrimp is good, checking for chemicals, and vetting out the bad product? That seems much cheaper and much easier than developing a brand new industry just to produce some more shrimp in the domestic market. Furthermore, economic theory also shows specialization is generally good. The US never specializes in shrimp. Why should we build a brand new market for this one niche reason? It's just very hard to justify. To really prove why in general you don't get better shrimp, people don't buy the better shrimp, and it's not economically viable. But three, even at their absolute best, as we told you in cross exams, which you never heard a proper response to, unemployment in these other countries is going to happen when they heavily rely upon shrimp and you suddenly cut them out. This is the very best case. What they say here is, oh, but the US is more important here. This is a very strange tension, because the other argument is these mangrove trees in these foreign countries are getting cut down. That's a terrible thing because we care about the environment there. But when it comes to the workers there and their jobs and their livelihoods they spend the whole life on, apparently it doesn't matter and it's USA first. Very unclear what the logic here is. I think that's very, very problematic. So we beat them at their best, beating them in their entire case, as they pretty much only argue about shrimp. What do we tell you? Let's talk about the local community. Here is where the proper comparative is very weak. Because when we ask, why don't we just build these fully isolated pens on the coastline, they say, Oh, it doesn't look very nice. I mean, like, if the comparison is these ultra expensive things no one's gonna buy from and we absolutely need shrimp, let's just take the trade off, right? We build these pens on the coastline, it doesn't look very nice. We don't think that's a massively bad trade off. But furthermore, even if you wanna build these outer coasts, you know, these little pens in the middle of the ocean, you still need to build things like ports, like nurseries, as research shows on the coastline, anyways, so it doesn't actually make it much better. Therefore, there's literally no unique benefit in terms of a tangible way why we shouldn't build on the coastline where it is cheaper. But furthermore, you also reduce employment on their side because the nature of farming, as I said, is very automated. It's these ships going around and collecting things. The average fish farmer on the coastline doesn't reap those benefits because they don't have the skills to actually reap those benefits. Because it's a very automated industry, as I said, you know, remote control pens or whatever, in general, locals will not get employment and be displaced in that world. We think that is worse off than our side, where yes, maybe it looks a little less aesthetic, but people on the coastline are likely to get jobs in these fish farms and will be better off. So when it comes to employment in local communities, we think the trade off is much better than our side. And finally, in terms of the environment, this is a little bit of new content because I think in general, as we have told you, in most cases, the unique benefits of open ocean agriculture happen when it actually is connected to the ocean, right? When it's not these isolated pens, there's nothing unique. In those instances, we are able to farm fish in these open environments, which might have certain benefits. They didn't talk about them. We'll assume there are some benefits. In those cases, it still causes environmental harm because things like, for example, as we have told you, there are things like diseases being spread, things like, for example, fish you know, getting out, for example, in the Atlantic, 40% of like the, the salmon farms like, you know, in the open ocean, like, escape local farming. In these instances, you get the spread of, spread of diseases, you get the spread of different species <coughs> mixing, you damage the food chain, and in general, you can harm the environment in that world. So in this area, the other side didn't talk about, we're showing that even in their best case, when there are unique benefits, there are still unique harms that accrue that doesn't make it worth it. Very proud to be on all. versus off the shore. Uh, we made an argument saying that, um, once again, it's better, what's, like, what's, uh, in addition to it, it obstructing the view of like, tourists and just the local community, that it also is better for it so that it doesn't in interrupt 
like environmental, the environment, the local environment that already exists there. So how exactly would that not be enough of a reason that you can't do it because you have more? So first of all, if we're gonna build them, we're not gonna build the, like we don't have to build these tents on literally the entire shore, right? If it's a tourist beach or a village right on the edge, we're not just gonna like block off their view entirely. We're not gonna put it on like tourist beaches, right? We can actually choose location. There are many places where there aren't tourist beaches, we can build these. And secondly, if you're gonna farm in a local environment, what does that mean, right? Like, what are you? What are these places that like actually the local harvesting? local environment, as opposed to let's say the local fish that swim around the area, the, the seaweed or the kelp that you know, that you know kind of cut, that lives underground, and just like let's say when you're off like the, okay. the oysters and the stuff that naturally occurs there, like there's even though there is a, like even on places where there isn't like a high amount of tourists, there's still a local environment that will um, exist in that area that doesn't need to be interrupted by a boat. Okay, but by your argumentation, don't you also not want that to happen because it obstructs the view of the villagers and it looks pretty bad to have these farms in the coast? Like, what's that's the what you just said, that we don't want the boat to be there. But you're saying the reason we can't build these tents is because there are other local fish farms on these areas where there's local environment, right? I, I, we were just saying that it obstructs the, that the fact that the presence of the boats in that area will obstruct the view of other, of, of the local, that will, and we've been, like, in, intruded on, like, the local communities that live on the beaches. Okay. And, um, so even in our, we're telling you in general, we don't have to build it literally right next to local communities, but like even if we do, we think in general that leads to employment. So right? how and exactly would it being close to the shore be more beneficial as opposed to it being further away? Um, well, we told you one, it's not prohibitively expensive and that like driving a boat 300 miles into the ocean, collecting a bit of fish and driving it 300 miles back is not only terrible for the environment, but also in general quite expensive. If it's on the shore, locals can actually work there. You don't have to drive very far out and also you don't disrupt the, you know, the further ocean, like larger environments if we're talking about open tents here. But in terms of closed tents, we think by your own analysis, it could literally be anywhere, right? It's just a box of water. We can put it anywhere. We can even put it inland if we actually want to next to a lake or something. There are many possibilities that are not 300 miles into the middle of the ocean. Okay, thank you. And um, also um, on, um, so also, can you refer to my argument of exactly why um, shrimp farming isn't a good, in the argument saying that shrimp farming is a poor um, approach to um, open ocean aquaculture, I just, we're saying it's not suitable because in general the unique benefits of having it in the open ocean is you get to interact with the other, you know, the other animals in the open area in terms of like, you know, having a water and stuff, right? But if you're having an entirely enclosed tent, we think it's very expensive and there's no unique benefit to being in the middle of the ocean. So like in terms of open ocean aquaculture, it's not very important because we can have these tents anywhere, right? They are very expensive, but we don't have to build them in the middle of the ocean. Okay, thank you. Um, and um, also, um, also if you make it, you make it, the claim that technology doesn't exist, but I've also looked in multiple warrants of how the other surge of seafood, like the sh shellfish farm in Norway and a um, other like other countries have be, have had these developments, and the U.S. already has this company and um, already has this company based in Massachusetts. So how exactly is there not the the that other technology that just isn't possible? For no, the idea we didn't say it doesn't exist. We said that it does exist because one like you said, right, which is very expensive. It's an enclosed tent. So that doesn't represent all of open ocean aquaculture. The other parts of it, like open netting, you didn't talk about at all. We told you the environmental harm is there anyways. But in terms of enclosed jobs, Within the fact that we don't need netting, that all, which already poses that environmental risk, makes us a little bit better than other technologies that are um, being produced right now. Um, you have to defend both cases because they both exist. We but it's also. To defend both cases. But like open ocean we're aquaculture we're includes all of it. one right? instance where this makes our situation a little bit better. Thank you. Thank you. All right, two minutes of prep time. You want to take it? Yes, please.
Awesome. So I'm going to start with just a brief overview um, again, and then responding once again to some of the major arguments that were made. Okay, and starting now. Open ocean aquaculture creates a viable solution to increasing domestic shellfish in an environmentally sustainable and healthy manner. Our first point is that the U.S. needs to accelerate open ocean aquaculture to meet its growing demand for seafood, which the NAIC has failed to address. How do you expect to meet this growing demand of seafood without without um, aquaculture? Your main argument was that um, you could do it on the coast. Doing it on the shore um, has, does not have the potential for the potential for expansion the offshore offers. There are fewer conflicts with users in crowded coastal areas when doing it offshore. We are talking about increasing seafood production as much as possible. There's only so much room on the coast, but near infinite room in the ocean. Pure coast production could never meet the growing demand for seafood that large that um, large scale expansion is therefore impossible. You can only do this with the ocean. In the coast, you need to keep growing and growing to meet this demand for seafood. You can't do that. You guys are talking about how we're just talking about this little modular thing. We can continue these and make a bunch of them, and not just in the U.S., in different countries. We are not only talking about the U.S. This example was just one example of a patented system that is already operating in Massachusetts. We can give that patent to other countries and have them also operate in a safe manner, which could eventually meet the seafood production. Next, our... Um, our next point was that the health of American consumers is harmed by importing shellfish as American as environmental regulations in other countries are not as strict as those enforced in the U.S. Let me remind you of some evidence. We read the card that the Consumer Reports conducted tests imported shrimps to the U.S. found that 60% of raw shrimp tested positive for bacteria that can cause food poisoning. This is this is shrimp farmed in Southeast Asia. While doing it in these safe conditions in a regulated environment that open ocean aquaculture allows for. We can replicate this in other countries and therefore have completely safe production of each of the shrimp. And it can be done at a low cost, which we also mentioned and we'll get on to in a moment. Our fourth point was that open aquaculture is a viable solution to increasing the domestic the supply of domestic shellfish. Again, we have not addressed this. Next, to framing. We were advocating for one case in which the U.S. provides permits to local and private fishing companies to use these map systems for shellfish farming. Prefer our framing because one, the resolution does not require that we talk about the entire world for more of a narrow scope of the debate, we should just talk about the U.S. because that's within our level of control. We are approaching this debate as policymakers for these permits. We can't control what other countries do. Overall, yes, we affirm that the OO aquaculture environment is desirable. That's our first argument of our earlier speeches. We just provide one way to make this a little bit better for human consumption of the environment. Local employment. It is giving the permits for those boats that employs local companies. They need people to perform maintenance, go out on the boats to harvest, and control these conditions of the boats. And then there's still the shellfish too. Anything that's creating more employment, so therefore that is not a viable solution, or a viable argument. This is more than just in the U.S. The map is just an example, and we've also um, given examples of other countries like Ecuador and Norway. The fact that these are systems are enclosed makes it better than um, doing it like not enclosed. And we, we, we have explained that you can regulate the systems, which you guys keep saying, no, the environment is a factor that's that's coming in, that's uh, that will impact the production. But no, it's an enclosed environment, it's an enclosed cell, and we have remote controls that can regulate the environment in that cell. It is not the open ocean environment that you guys keep saying. So I feel like you are not listening to the exact plan that you're giving. There is no um, costs are driven to a minimal impact. The environment impacts are to the environmental impacts on current farming methods. Vote for the affirmative, vote for MAPS. This is, okay, sorry, just a moment. Um, yeah, it's also better for education to talk about the US. We can't control what the rest of the world does. This is just a framework for other countries to follow and they easily can. This patent is not just for the United States. This is for any country that wants to use it. You guys have failed again and again to address our number one problem, which I would like to, again, hence the judge, which is the increasing demand for seafood. Not doing it with aquaculture will not be increasing. You will not be able to reach the demand of seafood. Doing it on the coast will never be able to reach the demand of seafood because you can't infinitely do it. There will be push from the, a push from citizens in the environment, and in the end of the day, there's going to be so much space on land. The oceans are huge. We haven't populated the oceans like we have the land, and we never will. Therefore, this is the only solution to the increase in seafood that is needed for 
the feeding of um, the increasing population. Thank you. Before concluding this debate and talking about the big ideas that we discussed, let's just talk about the props framing first. Because at the end of the right, like the last speech, it's not incredibly narrow. What they said is we only want to talk about the US, we only want to talk about agriculture when it's in these entirely enclosed environments, and that's a specific instance we want to defend. I think that's just unbelievably narrow, because if we think about agriculture, we think about agriculture around the world, it's just much more context than specifically shrimp, specifically in the US, specifically using these super nice high-end machines, as they said in the case of you know the maps thing or something, right? In these instances, like let's say they win everything they talk about, that's still a very niche part of what the debate is about. The motion doesn't say let's defend the US using these specific machines when it comes to entirely enclosed environments farming fish. The motion simply just says, should we or should we not accelerate the development of open ocean agriculture? So we talk about open net fishing, talking about other countries doing this, talking about global markets, the impact on those global markets. Those are the impacts that we gave you that were entirely ignored just like because they said, oh, we don't want to talk about that. We just want to talk about the US. This is not specifically policy debating. I don't know how policy debating works. This is some kind of like, you know, merge of different formats. And I think we have to discuss all those other cases to make it a reasonable debate. So all the arguments on the environment is farm because open net fishing leads to the mixing of breeds, mixing of diseases, all the arguments about how global markets are affected still stand and we're never actually engaged with. We already win just off that, right? But now, let's talk about within the framework of what they talked about, talk about the clashes here. One, what do they actually want to talk about? Shellfish and shrimp. Let's specifically discuss why on every layer we win this argumentation. One, I just want to question, and I know it's weird to question this at the very end of the debate, but they never defended this. How big actually is the problem? Because the prop keeps telling us we need shrimp, we need seafood, but they never substantiated how big of a problem this is. Let's just throw it out there. We don't have enough shrimp and people want shrimp. That doesn't sound like an absolutely terrible world, and it doesn't sound like it justifies hundreds of millions of dollars of spending building these pens, building these super nice boats. In the world, we don't have enough shrimp. I don't think the world ends. I don't think it justifies a massive investment. I don't think prop ever justified that massive investment. So ready right off the bat, they don't prove their burden because they don't prove the problem is actually that big in the very first place. But now, secondly, is this actually the only solution? We gave you two solutions in general that were generally unaddressed. One, free markets work in a way that fulfill demand. If there really is a massive demand in the US for shrimp, foreign shrimp markets that specialize in shrimp have an incentive to actually expand. Then, if the issue really is just this shrimp is unsafe in some instances, 
There are many other solutions. You could bet string better when it comes to the importing process to get rid of the stuff that doesn't have you know, that, that, that has like you know illnesses and stuff within it. You can invest in foreign fish markets that specialize in fish and add more regulations to those areas, and you probably also reap other economic benefits from that. These things are much cheaper and much more reasonable solutions rather than develop a brand new shrimp industry in the US, which has never had before and never had an incentive to do. So we already on that point, we see there are other solutions that are more feasible. But secondly, we said we can also build these pens in the coastline, right? Because by their own framing, what they want is in entirely enclosed pens. Their argument here is quite strange because they say the coast is limited. Okay, the coast is limited, but the US coast is also massive, right? Like, all they say here is, we're never going to fill the amount of demand for the shrimp we need. But they never tell us how much shrimp we need. If we fill up the entire coastline with shrimp pens, is that really still not enough shrimp for the people of the United States? I'm pretty sure we don't need that much shrimp. I'm pretty sure the problem isn't that big. But furthermore, once again, by their own modeling, it doesn't even need to be on the coast. It's entirely enclosed pens filled with water. You can literally build them anywhere. You can build them in New York City if you want to, right? It's probably not economically viable, but neither is their plan anyways. So in that case, I would argue you can build these pens anywhere. You can build them next to lakes, you can build them inland. Therefore, it doesn't need to be in the middle of the ocean where it's expensive and bad for the environment. Now, furthermore, will it actually work? We tell you it is far too expensive. Their response to our arguments on how, you know, you know, it's not viable to send ships there, it's very bad for the environment to send ships, these, you know, open ocean pens very far away. We have these very nice moving around boats called maps. Let's say they use that, right? That machine, just to me, looks unbelievably expensive. It's something only like you know super wealthy companies can actually afford. So if like if we need so much trim that we need to mass produce it, can we really afford and can any company justify buying thousands and thousands of those super expensive looking ships just to farm a little bit of shrimp off each of them? I don't think that's ever economically viable. I think that super expensive plan never outcompetes foreign markets that want to import in. That is a big issue for their case because free markets still exist, right? So even though they have a bunch of these ships producing shrimp, it is going to be super expensive and never outcompetes the foreign shrimp produced in specialized markets that are generally much, much, much cheaper. <coughs> so in that world, the shrimp that they hate, the shrimp that's apparently very bad for you, very bad for people, never gets displaced and therefore they don't solve the problem at all. All they have now is you know more super expensive shrimp on the market that nobody is going to buy. So on that point, I think it's never financially viable, they never prove why it's viable, and therefore doesn't even solve the root of the issue. And finally, in terms of other countries, we told you there's a harm, right? That like you display in, in the very best case, you destroy worker, displace workers in other countries that absolutely need these jobs to survive because it spent their whole life developing skills in the street market the country specializes. No response here, they just say, oh, the United States matters the United States matters more. I think the average United States ship consumer is less important than the employee in a foreign country that absolutely needs a job. We win the comparative in their best case. Now, on local workers, they told you on their side in the pre, you know, previous speech, we actually preserve local jobs because we need people to maintain these ships and drive these ships. The individual fish worker who works on the coastline doesn't have the same skill set as a maintenance worker or a ship driver. Therefore, most people who used to work in fish farms and harvest fish are now being replaced by automation and those super fancy devices they showed you. That is direct you know, displacement. So even in our worst case, if apparently we have to build these fish pens and fish farms right on the coast of where people live, that is still a better trade-off because even though the coast looks a little less nice, they still get jobs, they get employment, and they can actually survive in these markets with the skills they develop. On their side, you displace workers, you benefit companies only in the very best case, and you never actually solve the root of the issue. So for all these reasons, even under their super narrow framing, which it doesn't encompass the entire debate, we still win. Very, very proud to be on all. Um, I thought this was a good debate and a great example, I think, of kind of high level ATC debating where we have you know, lots of different types of arguments, both supported with evidence, supported by logic, supported by other types of evidence besides cards, like just empirical examples. And so I do want to emphasize that, that is something I appreciated about this debate is that there definitely is, everyone is taking evidence, I think, at its best, not caring whether or not it's presented in a particular format necessarily or a particular type of evidence. Um, that said, I do vote affirmative in this debate, and I think there are a couple of reasons why. And then I'll give some advice to both teams. So in general, I think the affirmative wins kind of the 
the claim that seafood demand is increasing in the United States. This is the first piece of NOAA evidence from this year that they read in that initial speech um, that where consumption is increasing to the tune of about eight ounces a week and that we have either the options of increased imports and I think they're winning arguments that those imports are bad for health and they're bad for local Southeast Asian environments and or we can increase development and it seems like the plan to give permits to companies to build these modular um, open aquaculture development systems would, would meet that. Um, the few kind of, I would say the, large, the largest negative strategy advice that I would give is that it's very hard to distinguish in this debate um, kind of the negative and the affirmative argument. So there's a lot of debate about why the plan is not perfect, right? The plan might not resolve its impacts, the plan might not benefit as much as they say, but that's different than presenting an argument that says the plan will cause something undesirable. And you get here a little bit. So for example, when you're talking about this will result in a loss of Southeast Asian jobs, that is something negative, right? That the plan is causing. And so in an ideal world, I think these last rebuttal speeches are comparing those impacts to each other. So I'm comparing the impact of increased domestic shrimping with an economic, environmental, and a health benefit to Yes, but also you're putting these Southeast Asian farmers out of business. And I think another argument similarly you could have been making is like you said that 60% of the shrimp has um, right, bacteria in it that can cause food poisoning. That shrimp doesn't go away. You just say the Southeast Asians should be the ones eating this diseased shrimp, right? And so like, I don't know, that seems like an argument that I would be like, well, globally, we're not, that would not be improving the health of people on the planet. It just changes who is getting sick and who isn't. Um, however, that argument is not necessarily made. And the other argument I want to talk about is that there is a really big push in this debate about the framing, about if this should be just the United States, if this should be global. And I think the negative is right on the truth claim of like, well, yeah, the plan doesn't say United States only. However, the issue for me and why that argument is not persuasive to get a negative ballot is because why does it matter? So, okay, you win that I should evaluate global impacts, not just impacts that benefit the United States, but then you're not giving me a lot of what those are. And so that's why I was talking earlier about the impact comparison. And so even if I agree with you and I say, let's look at the impacts on a global scale, it's not just about US benefit, I still think the affirmative wins because they're isolating clear benefits, as well as they do have an argument, which is like, well, we are affirmative and we're using the United States as a kind of case study or as an example of why it's desirable in general. Um, the other thing I will specify is that um, while I do want to balance, you know, kind of logic with the use of evidence, it is very difficult for me in this debate to think about awarding a negative ballot when Boston College has presented um, not only relevant evidence, but evidence that has been extended throughout the debate that is directly answering some of your claims with logic. And I don't see you um, or Georgia Tech necessarily, I think, giving those evidence arguments as much credence as you should. So, for example, in the middle of the debate, the second affirmative, the second negative speech, there is, for example, a big discussion about pricing, that this is going to be priced as a, you know, high-level commodity. People won't buy it because they're still going to buy the kind of cheaper or imported shrimp. However, they presented evidence in the second affirmative speech. Um, the author sounded like, I think you said, Zizek. Uh, from 23, that it lowers the prices and increases the demand. And so you've said, you've asserted, right, that it's going to be priced as a high commodity good. They have evidence that says, no, it won't. Price is low and it meets demand. And that's kind of where the debate ends. And so it's not that I'm immediately checking out on they have evidence and you don't. It's they presented an argument of evidence that doesn't necessarily get responded to. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so I think in a world even in which you don't have evidence, which in general I think a little bit of evidence would have been helpful in this debate, um, then the next step would be at least engaging with the affirmative evidence, I think, on a more substantive level. Um, so they, when you're asking them things like they don't have an environmental impact, and it's, it's difficult for me to look on my flow and say, well, they have food print 2022 saying there's a local pollution impact. They have Cape Men in 2023 saying 20% of global mangroves have been destroyed because of coastal aquaculture. And so it's difficult for me to give kind of credence to your claims when there's evidence that's been not responded to. Um, I have a couple of little tips for each speaker, and then I'll let you ask questions or let you go if you have. For the first affirmative speaker, 
Um, definitely take all your time in this debate, even if you're like my pre-prepared stuff. 